Eight, could it get any tighter? Well, actually it could. Games being decided by the bagginess of shorts. Is that really out of bounds? And where was Lester Quinones when you needed him? Or go the other way, Marquez Green. Nothing's getting past those shorts. Let's go. Infuriated watching that replay. My goodness, and they overturned it. <laughs> Crazy. How we got here. Oregon State, the dream continues. Could be the highest seeded team, or is it lowest seeded team? I never know which one. Ever to make the final four, the 12 seed. Baylor, Houston, old reliable. Arkansas needed every second and bounce of that rim to beat 15 seeded Oral Roberts. And Gonzaga, Michigan, USC rolling. So here's UCA Alabama, the game of the weekend nominee. UCLA recovering from the gut punch at the end of regulation, dominating overtime. This was the game with the baggy shorts out of bounds. A lot to take in. Israel Gutierrez around the horn to you. Who's been most impressive here? Most impressive to me remains Gonzaga. And with all due respect to USC, who I think a lot of people are sleeping on, uh, I do think Gonzaga just looks like the best team. And even though they aren't playing or firing on all cylinders, or probably a 9.5 out of 10 given what they can do, they still look overwhelming. Drew Timmy, again, I've said this a couple of times, will be the face of the tournament by the time it's all over. This thing is amazing. When he puts people in the spin cycle is my favorite thing that happens in college basketball this year. So to me, without even having Jalen Suggs required to do much scoring, and you still have a dominant win, I still think it's Gonzaga. Most impressive, Emily Kaplan. It's Michigan to me. Tracy Wilson reported that Isaiah Livers is going to be out for yeah. the rest of the tournament. And for the first time, I'm like, that's not going to be a problem. And that's no offense to Isaiah <laughs> Livers. They really could use his threes. But Jawan Howard's team just adapts. All of the talk before this game at Florida State was, oh, Michigan's never played a team with the size and the length of Florida State. Well, they outscored them in the paint 52 28, mm -hmm. the 50 points with the second most points that Michigan has scored in the paint in the last 15 years. And another reason I'm impressed by Michigan is that because they won this game, Big Ten is not the only conference with a big yolky egg on its face. The ACC is now 4-7 and seven in this tournament. Okay, all right, that may be true. The ACC, but nobody struggled like the Big Ten. But I will give you points for Juwan Howard. Remember when the conversation was, are they just hiring a big name? Are they just hiring a guy to live up to the legacy? This is a, I mean, one of the great coaching jobs we've seen from a first-year coach. Uh, Clinton Yates, or second-year coach. Clinton Yates, please go ahead. I'm with you. Michigan and Juwan Howard have been the most impressive to me because not just when they hired him back then did people say he didn't know what he was doing. Let's not forget, they almost got into a fight with another team before this tournament started and they got yeah. things back together because they're that good of a squad. And the other thing is this, they beat the best team anybody faced in terms of, you know, the victors this weekend is my personal opinion. Florida State was a pretty good squad. So, you know, you can say what you like about Alabama <laughs> and UCLA upsetting them. Michigan, to me, they never looked like they were going to lose that game, which when you're playing a good team is an indication that you're well coach and an indication that your leadership is doing well. Michigan, to me, looks like the best team. Clinton just gave us a my personal opinion. Who else's opinion are you supposed to be giving us, Clinton? <laughs> so that's two for Michigan, one for Gonzaga. Pablo Torre, we turn to you. You know, all this talk about Michigan being well coached and really peaking at the right time really does beg the question, where did they get this motivation from? And I want to just propose a theory, Tony, because oh, no. was a certain yeah. panelist oh, no, on the show, no. maybe the guy who picked <laughs> against Michigan. You picked them to lose in the first Mount round, Bob. What are you Texas doing? Southern was 16 team. That team attracted me, and Isaiah Livers was missing. And then they go and score like 30 straight points in the paint to start the second half of this win against Florida State, okay. which was definitive in all the ways that Emily Kaplan said. Yes, I just want to point out that Maybe they just need a little bulletin board okay, material. All right, all right. Wait, 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 Pablo, you picked against them. You didn't even know who they were playing in the first round, and you picked against them. You're getting no points for Michigan. Can I ask you a question, Pablo Torre? Gonzaga, right now, yes. the least talked about, most dominant, undefeated team going into the Elite Eight. What are we talking about with the Zags? I mean, the Zags, Tony, they have three... Definitely two first-round NBA draft picks, maybe a third, and Corey Kispert and Drew Timmy, as Izzy mentioned, and Jalen Suggs, who to me is still the best point guard in the nation. So this is a team that has the Cinderella branding, but all of the talent of a Goliath, and I think we're still waiting for America to catch up with the fact that their talent level is as strong as anybody else in the country. We're waiting for America to catch up? We're waiting for you to catch up. You just talked about how you were <laughs> responsible for Michigan's run here. Emily Kaplan, can you focus on the number one team in the country that it hasn't lost the game yet, but is impressing nobody on this panel except Gutierrez. 
Yeah, what we're seeing is a power. As my newly beloved Loyola Ramblers have taught us, it's very hard to gain respect as a mid-major, and it's even harder to sustain it. They have been double-digit favorites in 22 straight games, which is the longest single-season streak in 25 years. They have so much offensive power, firepower. If you ask anyone in America to name one player on Gonzaga, they'd probably say Jalen Suggs. He was the only starter without double-digit points in their win. That's a, that's a good point, Emily. But are we, we're still calling them the mid-major? Clinton Yates, are we still calling Gonzaga mid-major? You know, that's, that's an excellent question because I think a lot of the pressure of this team has to do with comparison to other Gonzaga teams that people have thought were going to go far and maybe or maybe didn't. And so I think that that's something you have to take into account with this squad. Overall, though, they are dominant. You turned that game on yesterday. They had two wide-open layups in the key with no other defenders after made buckets because they're moving the ball that quickly against other people from a talent standpoint. I think Gonzaga's biggest enemy in this case are themselves and the weight of their own pressure and their own program. If their name was Duke written on the front of the jersey, people would have them running away with it. Alas, they don't because it's a different squad. So we'll see if they can take that pressure. I think a lot of people have them running away with it right now. They haven't lost the game all year. <laughs> Their scoring margins, one of the best in college basketball history. Three of the remaining eight teams come from the Pac-12, which none of you guys had coming in. Not even you, Clinton Yates. Don't take credit for this. I have now, SC where they are. I have SC where they are. Don't forget <laughs> that. Conference of champions. Yes. Yeah, so three of eight. Well, that's happened four of the last five years that a conference has sent three of eight. But what are we talking about with the Pac-12 here, Clinton? I think we're talking about a conference that overall is one of the better coach conferences in the country. Listen, the Pac-12 is still a talent-laden place simply because of where it is. Oregon State, half the dudes on the team are from L.A., so it's not like this is some sort of geographical change just because of where they are. They're good teams. They're doing well together. I think UCLA is an incredible story. SC is a great story considering how that season, you know, their season completely changed once they beat USC L.A. So everybody's coming together. Talked to Mick Cronin last week, and he is having a good time. So we like to see it. Pablo Torre. I think the only mythological explanation here is Bill Walton. I don't know how else this could have happened, Tony. The fact is four Pac-12 teams seemed like a stretch to get into the tournament field at the outset of bracket picking. So the fact that we have three of the eight right now has to do with randomness, yes, but also I think a bunch of guys who are absolutely peaking when it matters the most, which I credit to, yeah, maybe Bill Walton. Emily Kaplan. UCLA is just the second team ever to make it to the Elite Eight after ending the season on a four-game losing streak. The other was Wake Forest in 1977. So unless you're someone who believes that the world happens in 44-year cycles, no one could have predicted this. Understandably, but when you're watching them play, and when you're watching all these Pac-12 Pac teams, they look like they're the better team just about every time they're on the court. Yeah. UCLA, gave, Alabama's a good team. Gave them everything they could handle the entire game. And just when you thought... It was a gut punch to let up that beautifully drawn play in the last seconds of regulation. They mowed him down in overtime. All right, we got to talk tonight, and we'll talk about another Pac-12 team right now. Oregon State, the 12 seed. We've never seen a 12 seed get to the Final Four. Here's our chance. They're up tonight against Houston and Arkansas and Baylor. So a 12 and a 2 and a 3 and 1, but throw the records and seeds out. Who has the advantage tonight, Clinton? To me, I think it's Houston. The Kelvin Sampson story here is very interesting to me. For a long time in his career, we always sort of thought he couldn't get over the hump or other things were happening and various different violations or what have you. But this guy's a great coach. He's gotten that program back to a point I think they can really be proud of itself. I think there's a little bit of a win-one for Sampson situation here. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's the one game and the other game. Baylor, the favorite in this game, the one seed in this game. You have them at the advantage. I think tonight? Baylor is the better team here. I, listen, they're more athletic than most of the teams they play against, something that's got a lot of value in this tournament, and that's what they play too well. I think Baylor is on. Pablo Torre? Yeah, give me Baylor, a top three most efficient team in the country, according to Ken Pomeroy. But Oregon State, man, I still don't under I truly don't understand how the team that was picked last in the Pac-12 is suddenly now on the verge of a Final Four. I am done picking against Oregon State. Well, here's how a team picked last gets to the Final Four or on the, on the precipice of it. The people who are picking them don't know what they're doing. That would clearly be my answer to that. Israel Gutierrez, how about you? Um, they're doing it with defense, and so is Houston, frankly. I think that's going to be a very low-scoring game, and I'm just going to take Oregon State, maybe ride a hot shooting hand from Jared Lucas and eking that one out in a, in a close-scoring game. I think Baylor's going to win that other one. You talk about a couple of teams that had horrendous shooting nights from the perimeter, Baylor and Arkansas. I'm going to take, take the team that had a slightly better shooting performance in Baylor and think that they'll uh, eke one out in a higher-scoring game. Kaplan. Yeah. 
Arkansas has won three games despite having double-digit deficits, and that shows grit, which is a big compliment for me, a hockey girl. But Baylor just makes teams uncomfortable. They have 54 turnovers in the last three games. They also have outscored teams 60 to 12 on turnovers, which shows their ball security. All right, let's look at the ball security here. Oh, Pablo, Tori, minus 14, well, very insecure. Uh, <laughs> Israel Gutierrez, Emily Kaplan, Clinton Yates, looks like <laughs> it's a three-person game in buy or sell next. Well, we'll talk March Madness. Stick around. I've had worse. March Madness, how we got here. Michigan Baylor, game of the weekend nominee. Michigan was so tough to force overtime. Baylor surviving. UConn. And Avina Westbrook and Kristen Williams and Aaliyah Edwards taking the Paige Becker's Caitlin Clark game over. UConn advancing. Indiana and Arizona and Stanford, South Carolina, Louisville with ease. And Texas doing the impossible late last night, holding Maryland to 61, winning late. Who has been most impressive around the horn? Clinton Yates. To me, it's got to be Texas. I mean, listen, as much respect as I have for Brenda Fries' program, you know, this was a disappointing loss. They have a young team, though, and to, for Texas to take them out of their game, they were putting up hundos yeah. on people, which was amazing. And so they flipped the script at halftime. They were getting out-rebounded in the first half. The Longhorns were, ended up winning that rebound battle and winning that game. I think the Texas has to be because, again, the logic being they beat the best team of all the victims. Emily Kaplan? I'm buying South Carolina because no other panelist at Around the Horn has them winning the tournament but me. But Aaliyah Boston, one of the best players in this country, best player of the team, mild foul trouble, zero points at the half, but Don Staley's team still figured it out after struggling and making defensive struggles the first two games. They really found their offense, shot 57 from three and 56 from the field in their win. Israel Gutierrez. I'm going with Stanford, and not just because they beat Missouri State by 27, but because they've been they're just so impressed with this nomadic team that were kicked out of their, they couldn't practice in their home place. They had to go to some other place. They had a high school gym where the lights got cut out during their practice, and they practiced under dim lights. And here they are just finding their groove in the NCAA tournament. And Anna Wilson can probably shut down anybody. And so I give her, I give that team a great chance. Everything you said is true, except maybe finding their groove. They are the overall number one seed here, Israel Gutierrez. Pablo Torre, how about you? I feel like everybody on the panel is trying to zag today and not take UConn, so allow me to just zig and take the team that's going to win the tournament, the team that has won games by 40, 30, 20, and probably by 10 points against Baylor tonight, if I may preview that game for just a second there. But to me, Paige Beckers, Tony, and you read, you mentioned it, three other names were all excellent, excellent players in this game. The number one freshman in the country, maybe the player of the year. Paige Beckers was the fourth, and that to me says so much about the depth that UConn has. And still has the yeah, let's break down that game on Saturday, because so much attention was on it, and it's easy to fall in love with the, the phenoms, the freshmen going head-to-head. -head. What did you see from UConn specifically, Clinton Yates? That was simply a great game. I thought Westbrook was the best player on the court. And listen, this is a Paige Becker's household, so I'm not looking at that as some big rivalry. Those two don't even guard each other, but that was about as entertaining a basketball game as I've seen pretty much in Kaplan. 2021. Yeah, it was a terrific game, and it's just such a shame that UConn now has to play Baylor in the next round because that really should be a final four. Gutierrez. I mean, look, you come for the main attraction, right? Come for the marquee matchup and stay for the really good basketball. And what I loved about Paige Becker is the more you watch her, the more you realize her passing might be her greatest skill. And she did a lot of that late in that game. That was uh, pretty impressive. You can't control that game for the most part. Baylor had their work cut out for them with Michigan, which is just so impressive making their first deep run in this tournament historically. Tonight, Baylor gets UConn. That's a one and a two, as you said, Kaplan. Could it be a Final Four? Could it be a national title game? One and a two now. And then we have a three and four on the other side, Indiana and Arizona. But you throw out the seeds now when you get to that point. The matchup of Oriema and Moki is absurd. 14 championships between them. 16 if you count Moki as a player. Even if you hear Moki say she can't outcoach Gino, which is what she's trying to tell us. Kaplan, who are you buying tonight? I'm buying Baylor. It feels like Melissa uh, Smith can't miss in this tournament. She literally did not miss against Michigan. I love watching Dijanae Carrington build with this team, but the key for them is inside. The Bears love getting inside, and I think that UConn's going to have a hard time defending them without getting into foul trouble. That's one for Baylor. Gutierrez, how about you? Isn't Kamoki, she's 4-4 four and four against that Gino Arnett. She doesn't even have a losing record against Gino, and so she can definitely outcoach him. Um, look, I'm going to go with UConn, though, just because of a lot of what Pablo said earlier, just in terms of their depth. And I do think that a freshman in Paige Beckers just seems to be growing and really leading that team when necessary. So I'm sticking with you. All right. I'm taking UConn, as I said, but I just want to point out that Kim Mulkey left some trash talk on the table if she wanted it, because 
UConn won tournament games without Gino Auriemma there because he was out, of course, with COVID. So if there's any year to say, actually, I'm the coach that matters, it would be this one. And she was too classy, it seems, to actually take that. Well, I mean, as far as trying to motivate your team, you know, when you're Baylor, you've won three championships recently. You're one of the best defensive teams going. And then you're like, oh, how can we possibly play UConn? That's what, that's the energy that you're getting there. Yates, who do you have tonight in that matchup? I got UConn, and I think Aaliyah Edwards is going to have a tremendous night in the front court. What she showed last game was incredible. She is just quite an athlete. I think you're going to see her cook tonight. Mm -hmm. Kristen Williams not getting the, the love from this panel after she had the biggest game against Iowa. Um, yeah. Look at these scores right here. Mm. Gutierrez and Yates. Yeah. I need a tiebreaker here for Gutierrez and Yates. Consider the tie mm. broken, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what? I got nothing for that. That's it. Yates advances. Yates versus Kaplan. Showdown in two minutes. I got no props. Buyout market is always about whether old guys can get it back for that last run. And that's what the Nets are doing with Griffin and Aldridge. But Drummond is 27, led the league in rebounding for the last five years. If rebounding still matters. Clinton Yates. Emily Kaplan, welcome to Showdown. What do the moves mean, Clinton? I think for Drummond, the pickup is huge for the Lakers. They actually need him in terms of inside, in terms of fouls and minutes, never mind the boards that he gives. As for Aldridge, the Nets already a super team. What's that guy going to do? Give me four, you know, 12-foot jumpers in a game? Big deal. By my count, there are now 41 combined all-star appearances on the Nets. It feels to me like all the Avengers gathering together to bring beat down Thanos, who is LeBron. And yeah, well, Marcus Aldridge might be Hawkeye, but he's an Avenger nonetheless. Uh, I don't know if Griffin and Aldridge are even as important Claxton for the Nets right now. Kaplan Point, Clinton Yates will move on. Mike Woodson to Indiana. He has never coached a college game before. After leaving Indiana as a player in the 1980s, it's been all pro. So, what kind of hire did Indiana just make, Emily? It's a smart one. He comes in with a great recruiting pitch. I'm the last coach to take the Knicks to the playoffs. He also has unfinished business. The team before he got to Indiana won a natty, and the team when he left won a natty, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. Clinton? Yeah, it's a fortunate one because, hello, somebody who likes Indiana wants to coach Indiana and stay in Indiana. That program is not what people think it is. There's a lot of expectations, former blue blood. Good for them for getting somebody to come home in that situation, and he's a good coach. You think making the jump from NBA to college is, is going to work still today, right now? Yes, we just yeah. talked about Jawan okay. Howard coming in apparently off the street. I believe That's it. That's how you win an it. argument, Yates. We'll move on. U.S. men's soccer out of the Olympics again, again. Third time in a row, the under-23 is losing to Honduras while the national team used Reyna, Pulisic, players who could have played in the under-23 rule of the Olympics, uh, and beat Northern Ireland in a friendly. So what's the major malfunction here? And how big a deal is it to miss the Olympics for the U.S. men's team, Clinton? I think it's a big deal. I mean, listen, in developmental circles in soccer, it's just embarrassing. People think a so-called soccer nation should have more creative midfielders who can actually finish stances more regularly. But Moro Daryl DK is what we want. That dude is a monster. Kaplan? It's a big deal because we won't get to see our young stars at the Olympics, but it's not that big of a deal because we are developing young stars. We have a guy playing for Chelsea. We've got a guy playing for Juventus. This is much progress in the U.S. men's program. But, but the, <laughs> the problem isn't U.S. soccer, all right? The problem is U.S. men's soccer. We'll move on. Five Dang. overtime uh, marathon to get into the Frozen Four. Look at how close North Dakota was to winning. Post, but then right back the other way, Minnesota Duluth, the game winner. This was after 142 minutes. It was a chance for them to defend their back-to-back -back championships. Emily, did you find yourself wanting more or less hockey? More. If this game is decided by a shootout, that's the equivalent of deciding an NCAA tournament game by a game of horse. Nobody wants this. It had cramps. <laughs> this had disallowed goals. This had perseverance. This is what hockey is all about. Let me tell you something. They call it the most exciting play in hockey for a reason. And guess what they don't have in games of horse? Defense. Let these kids take their helmets off, show them their faces, give me Olympic-style hockey rules like TJ Yoshi going over and over and over again, and it will be fun. All of you mouth-breathing hockey fans who are anti-shootout, get it together. People like it. Longtime hockey fans like me are one of them. Mouth breathing. How else are you supposed to breathe? You need your mouth to breathe. Uh, point. Game. FaceTime. Emily Kaplan. 
Next week is the three-year anniversary of the Humboldt bus crash where 16 people died when a truck T-boned a bus of junior hockey players. I've stayed in touch with two of the survivors and I just want to talk about them because I'm so inspired by them. They were 20 when this happened, experienced unimaginable trauma, but it mirrored to such grace. Caleb Dahlgren of Beacon of Positivity wrote his first book, Crossroads, and Tyler Smith is spreading the message about mental health, it's okay not to be okay. Look, guys, this is not easy to talk about, PTSD, grief, but these guys have shown just that you need to talk. Thank you for that, Emily, spending time, uh, strength coming from tragedy. That's it for today.